Welcome to the magical journey beyond mediocrity, where the mystical and the practical become aligned. You're listening to Meant for More, the Seeker's Guide to Success, with your host, Seeker's Guide and Coach, Kristen Lloyd. Kristen guides you through mindset shifts to increase your consciousness and live your best life. So let's leave mediocrity behind and step into your magical, magnificent life with Kristen. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Meant for More, the Seeker's Guide to Success. I am your host and Seeker's Guide, Kristen Lloyd. I am so grateful that you are here. Thank you again for tuning in to today's show. This is episode 19 of the Meant for More show, and our amazing guest today is Robin C. Crawford. Robin provides work and lifestyle design services A former professor, her current mission is to creatively respond to the dismal workplace satisfaction stats and the gaps in our typical approach to entering the wacky world of work with proven solutions delivered through private and group services. Welcome, Robin! Yay! (laughs) Hey, Kristen, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am well and so grateful to be a part of this this morning. This is going to be fun. (laughs) It is. I'm so grateful that you said yes. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. I love what you're doing here. It's fun to have great conversations with great people and shared wisdom. Aw, thank you. And it's I'm I'm so glad that you're on because I think that this is a huge topic that um a a lot of people I don't want to say they don't want to talk about it, but I think that they're confronted with their own choices when um, discussing like the dismal workplace environment and corporate mm-hmm. culture and what yeah. our passions are versus um, versus what we're doing in life. And so um, I'm, I'm really excited that this is something that we're really going to dig into today. And before we do, I always love to start with how you – um, with all of my uh, guests, how you got to your more, because this is the meant for more show. And as you are living your more and helping your clients to achieve their more, I always like to ask, what was your journey to more? What was your process or awakening or what was that like? And how did you get to where you are today? Well, I think I'm always um, moving closer to to my more. I don't know if you ever really arrived there. So I'm always doing that. I've got some cool things going on now. But if I were to just kind of summarize it quickly, I think I've been fascinated with the world of work for, you know, gosh, as long as I can remember. And I don't know if you know this, but I've had over 50 job titles in my adult life. And so no there, were time- <laughs> there were times when I was working two and three jobs because of the path that I took right out of high school. I didn't go to college right out of high school. At the time, I was more focused on uh, what I was doing as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I no longer practice that religion. But at the time, I was doing some uh, missionary work, and I decided to do that full-time and work part-time. So I had all kind of jobs doing all kind of things. And so I think that that was kind of planting the seeds for me because I'm always fascinated with, you know, what it is that people do and why they do it. And with me, if I wasn't happy with something in my work, I didn't have a problem changing making a different decision. So I've always been that way. So I'm sure that's the reason why I've had so many different positions. But I think all along the way, I've had this quest for understanding what makes us happy, not only in life, but also in our work, because our work is so personal, right? Kristen, that's how we spend most of our time. Our waking hours, most of them are spent as an adult anyway, engaged in some kind of work or some kind of compensation, I mean, some kind of work, whether it's compensated or whether it's not compensated, but some kind of contribution. And so I feel like as I've been exploring this over the years, I've landed in a couple different ways, you know, places I've I've worked in the corporate sector, I've worked in the nonprofit sector, and I've I've had an opportunity to start to own my own business. So I've kind of worked in all these different general areas to get a snapshot of what's going on in these areas. So again, it's all fascinating for me. So my journey really has been one of exploration, like trying this, trying that. 
and seeing what actually fits, what's kind of just right. I think about Goldilocks and the Three Bears, too hot, too cold, just right. And I so love that. Me, <laughs> and so for me, I feel like I'm nestled into what's my just right now because I'm able to really help others as a result of my journey of trying everything and going here and going there and figuring out and being so, you know, again, so excited about learning more about this wacky world of work and, you know, the traditional approach to doing it and where some of the gaping holes and the potholes are and how to fill those. And so as a university professor, uh, that's where I landed in academia and spent some time teaching there and loved doing that. I was interacting with students a good bit. And I kept hearing, I don't know, way too often around, you know, why are you here? Why do you want to major in that particular area? And I heard a lot of, I don't know, and I'm here because of someone else, not because of, of them, what they really right. wanted, what they were passionate about. And that bugged me. And I felt like I was limited in that space to be able to help them and have the conversations that I really wanted to have. Although I tried to do that as an advisor, um, when they'd come to, you know, get advisement on classes and what to take. And I'm like, you know, we could talk about what classes to take all day, but if you don't know where you want to steer your life mm-hmm. and you don't know what you really want to do, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. So that was the spark that got me to thinking, okay, let me start something on my own. So in 2010, actually in 2009, I got a life coaching certification to complement my degrees. Um, and uh, I started my own business focused on helping people design their best work life. And so it's kind of morphed a little bit since then over the last six, seven years, but it's always been rooted in helping people to figure out what their just right contribution is, how right. to create their best work lives. So that's kind of brought that's kind of brought me to where I am today. And I absolutely love what I do every single day. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. And 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 the journey of going uh through the academia, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and I remember that as a, because I had taught at a community college as well. And of course I was teaching the intro to site classes and, Mm -hmm. um, personal effectiveness classes, and they were still figuring it out. And, um, I, I can see where, where you had that experience of, you know, the, the, I don't know is from the students because there is this culture of you graduate high school, you go to college and you figure it out. You just declare your major. And even in some of my work with students now, they really don't know what they want to do. And they're still exploring this, that, or the other, but there's so much pressure to make a decision Mm -hmm. because, You've only got four years. Well, I mean, some people take longer, but, you know, theoretically, you only have four years and then you're out in the workforce. And nowadays in business, people are looking for MBAs and higher degrees. So now the master's has become the new bachelor's. And so that's I don't know if you see that in in your work, but I've seen that uh, where. Now there's this push, you finish the bachelor's and you go to the master's and then you have this education and then you, you get to work, let's say you're an accountant and you absolutely hate it. Where's the transition from that? (laughs) Right. Exactly. I think that you have something there. There is a lot of pressure. And I think in our society, college has become this absolute yes, next step, whereas college isn't for everyone. And in teaching, you know, I taught classes from 25 to 250. And it's interesting, in the larger classes, more general education classes, it was very interesting to kind of observe that there are so many students who just aren't, college isn't just right for them. There probably was another path for them to take. And it's interesting because in working with student clients, because I do work with students in addition to mid-career professionals right now, and I'm looking to spend more time working with students. I'm shifting that right as we speak. But in working with student clients, it's so evident that they are under so much pressure. Mm -hmm. I had a a young lady who met with me a couple weeks ago. And um, when she sat there, I just watched her body language. I mean, she was just tight. I mean, her breathing was so abnormal. I mean, she was really stressed out. She was like, I don't know what I need. I'm about to graduate in six months. And 
I really don't know if I want to do what I said I was going to do because I've spent all these years studying this and I really want to do something different. And if I do something different, my parents are going to be disappointed. There's so much pressure on them to make a decision and not enough guidance around figuring out what it is they want more of, Kristen. What kind of lifestyle do they desire? What kind of work do they want to contribute? And that to me is what just grabs my heart because I want to create that space for them to be able to explore because it takes a little time. You can't go right into college. I mean, there's some people, my husband, for example, he knew at 14 what he wanted to do and he's still doing that. That's rare today. There's yeah, so is. many folks who are have multiple interests like I do. And I love Barbara Sher, who's one of my favorite authors in this space, where she has the book Refuse to Choose. And I remember when I read that, I was like, oh my God, Barbara gets me. She understands. Right. I'm this person who has these multiple interests and understanding that you don't have to get rid of those and just figure out what that one thing is, but understand who you are and what you want to contribute first and figure out then the various different structures that you can contribute in after that. Because it might change, and stats actually support the fact that people are going to change, especially millennials and even Gen Xers are going to change jobs over five times. And, of course, I've already blown that out of the water with my over 50. (laughs) But the point is, is that you need time to explore. And so in college, you don't have to go right in and choose a major, and you may not even go to college. There's a gap year. There's so many other options. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. And, and, you know, as you, as you've kind of explored your own, your own career and, and moved forward, is that what's given you the inspiration, the the motivation behind the work that you do? Or was there, was it, was it your own experience or was it seeing everyone else's experience that motivated you more or a combination of both? I would say it's a combination. I certainly got to a point where, you know, I think when you have as many interests as I've had and you bounced around when I was growing up, excuse me, as a Gen Xer, that was career suicide to bounce around. The traditional approach was to find a career, you know, prop your ladder up against a wall and climb that ladder and stay with it. And I wasn't having that because it just, I couldn't figure it out. And I thought, well, what is wrong with me? Something is wrong with me. Um, And I mentioned Barbara Sher reading her book, Refuse to Choose. It changed a lot for me. But I think that it's a combination. But for me, I remember spending some time one day. I was here and, and I just had, you know, sheets all on the wall. And I was looking at a variety of different things. And I went through this kind of process to kind of figure some things out. And it was almost like, ah! It was like, wow, this is a very interesting thing that I've come to know here about myself. I wonder if I held the space for others to be able to do some exploring in this way, if they could come to some of these similar kind of conclusions about themselves, not necessarily a specific process that's outlined where there's steps, but just have some general idea of helping them to understand that it's the introspection that helps them to figure this out. It's not these outside assessments, not that they're bad. They certainly provide some good information like the strengths finder and, you know, a few others that we familiar with, we're familiar with related to communication skills and personality and who we work with and how we work and all of that. There are a lot of assessments out there that folks take when they're in that space of trying to figure out, what to do next as it pertains to work. But I think the best thing to do is really be introspective and quiet, slow down, quiet yourself and really figure out who am I? Who do I want to be? Who do I want to show up as in the world? And what do I want to contribute? That Those are big, big questions to ask. And when you ask people what they want, what they desire, You get blank stares sometimes, or I don't know, but we're the only ones who who do know. We're the experts on ourselves. So I think it's been a combination of my own experience and working with others over and over again that has shown me how important it is to be introspective in this area around figuring out what that contribution is. Mm -hmm. And, And I've seen where, you know, over time, um, one of one of the things that I love to say is clarity is it doesn't come in one shot. 
Clarity is something that happens over time. And the more questions you ask, the more clear you get. So it's you get clear on something in in the sense of this is I want more of this and less of this. And Mm -hmm. I want more of this and less of this. And I think that it's so much more of a process, whereas and, and this is part of our culture. We have such an instant gratification culture that, boom, I want it now. Boom, I want yep. it now. Mm-hmm. And yet the introspection, the I don't know, I think is terrifying to so many of these young people because they're expected to, you know, and I'm doing air quotes, have it together. They're, they're expected to know to have conviction in what they're doing. And when there's, when they're willy nilly or wishy washy, (laughs) it, it freaks them out because everybody's looking at them and it's like they're on stage, you know, (laughs) like they should know. (laughs) Because they're asked that question. I mean, think about it. All of us, when we think back to when we were very young, all of us were asked the question, so what do you want to be with? What or what do you want to be when you grow up, young lady? And, you know, a princess or an astronaut, you know, whatever. And, right. of course, graduate from those responses as we get older. But as soon as middle school, I was just talking to someone about this uh, last week. As early as middle school, kids start being bombarded with this pressure around deciding what college to attend. And I'm like, really? And I understand our culture has built this kind of structure around, I mean, it actually starts in kindergarten. (laughs) Like what kind of kindergarten class are you going to go to? Because parents have become so obsessed with their kids being successful. And so it really is sad in some respect because that puts so much unnecessary pressure on that individual for him and him or her to make those decisions early on before they've had an opportunity to explore. And again, there's so many other options. Take your time, slow down, uh, really get to know who you are again and what you desire. I mean, I can say that over and over again because I just see it over and over again, not only with students that I work with, but I often share with them the folks that I work with who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who are miserable in what they're doing because they didn't take the opportunity to figure that stuff out early on as well. And so now they're in this space where they're trying to figure that out as well. So it's really interesting. They are expected to know, but how can you know if you haven't been curious, if you haven't explored, if you haven't taken the time to kind of find those puzzle pieces and kind of put them in slowly to see what that big picture is for you. Right. 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 And you know, that brings me to another, you know, thought about what your purpose is, what your calling is. And I've heard some people say that, Oh, that, that everyone has a calling thing. That's a myth. But I hear you say that, that you, you clearly do not agree with that. So is it possible for every person to have a purpose, to have that calling of something that they they love and are aligned with in career? I think that particular discussion is is way bigger and longer than we can have in this in these few minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe that it is a myth. Why would only certain individuals have an opportunity to explore and figure out what it is that they can contribute that kind of hits that sweet spot that they love, finding that work that they love. Why would that only be possible for a few people who we know we've got? So we've got a number of examples of folks famous and otherwise who are doing what they love. Why would that just be possible for only a few people? What do they have that the rest of of folks wouldn't have? That makes no sense to me. And so I think that the naysayers oftentimes are those individuals who either expected to find whatever And it. I'm not saying it's a that it's that one thing I, I, actually say callings in the, in the plural. Um, there are some folks who haven't taken the time and perhaps because they haven't taken that time or haven't even shifted that belief around that negative belief around, well, it's not for everyone. 
that they're kind of stuck. And so they become these naysayers in that space. But I do believe that every individual, when they have an opportunity to really be self-reflective, they'll one, be able to understand who they are uniquely. I, I, I think I, it was Jack Canfield in one of his books, The Power of Focus, which is amazing, where I ran across that term natural brilliance. And I love it. Like each of us has this natural brilliance. And I like to define it as this combination of our own strengths and, and talents, those innate things that make us who we are, but also our passions and our interests and that purpose and all of these things, even the skills and experiences that we've acquired over the years that come together to make our unique what I like to call our unique work print, when we look mm-hmm. back and see what we've done and in all of the positions and ways that we've contributed, we can be able to identify things that we've been doing in there that really, really reflect the best of who we are. And so I believe that's possible for everyone. We're all you know, unique in our own way and have this combination of things that make us who we are. And when we truly understand that, then we can make decisions, use that as criteria to determine how we want to contribute in the world via work. Right. I love that. I love that phrase that you just coined, um, work print. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I have a, a specific inner size that I've created around the work print. Um, because as I worked with individuals and again with myself, I think I, I learned this myself in that whole process taking the time to go back to the very first time you had a position where, and I typically say where you were compensated for something, because there's, you know, there are certainly things we were doing where there was an exchange and we got a joy from how we were contributing, even as kids. But Mm -hmm. sometimes that very first job, you know, whether it was delivering newspapers or babysitting or whatever it was, I try to get folks to go back to that very first time they exchanged a service or a product for compensation no matter how young they were, and then begin to track that from that point forward, looking at each of the positions that you've had through the years, whether you're a young person and it's just been, you know, a couple years or you've been in the workforce for quite a while, you're seasoned and you've got, you know, 30, 40 decades or 30, 40 years under your belt, taking a look at those various different positions. And when you look at that, And you begin to almost like a researcher, like you're a detective. You're looking at the patterns in all of these positions that you've had. And you begin to see there are going to be some things that you did that you didn't like to do. Maybe some things you hated. But in each position, even when we're in positions where we don't enjoy them, there are little, little glimmers of of joy, or maybe some may not refer to it or or label it as joy, but things that we like to do where we kind of gravitated to, maybe we enjoyed talking to people, or maybe we enjoyed helping people, or maybe we enjoyed teaching something, whatever it is, that work print really helps you to be able to tease out and glean some of those things. It's like, again, you're a detective trying to find these little clues, but that work print thing is pretty powerful. And I have it as a free tool on my website. Oh yeah. Well, well, before we go, we're going to get, we're going to make sure that everybody has access to that. Yeah. Um, So is there a, is there a specific process involved in creating the work life you desire? Like, is it a, a mixture of these inner sizes or is there is there something else to it? I think there is. I think each person has his or her own process. I think when I first started doing this, I tried to come up with a very specific set of steps. And what I learned early on, which I figured would happen anyway, because my focus is really to help people to understand that this is their process that starts with it starts with you. And so it's going to be unique. So for some folks I talk with, beginning with the work print exercise and having them go through that process is very appropriate. For others, they don't need that. They've got a little bit more insight into some of those clues that they would have found out by going through that process. And so starting with them is, you know, a little diff a little different. So I think it's on a continuum and everyone when I talk to them, I'm able to kind of assess, okay, where are they here? Do they have a pretty clear idea of who they are and what they think they want? You know, I, I worked with a young lady online uh, a couple days ago who is clearly uh, very self-aware, 
Uh, she just graduated from college, very self-aware, uh, has several interests, but they all fall within a particular category. And so for her, it was a very different conversation than someone who doesn't have a clue. They're like, I have no idea what I what I want to do. I really don't even know who I am and what I want. It's just a very different conversation. So I don't know if it is a process, but I don't know if it's a step by step process, because I think each person is individual. And having worked with so many people over the years, it's become very clear that my job is to really listen to see where they are in that process so I can meet them right where they are and then hold the space to help them to move closer to where they actually desire to be. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, because you know, I agree each individual has um, their own, well, not just their own path, but their own goals for where they want to go. And what I mm-hmm. see in so many of the clients I have, and tell me if you see this, um, so many get stuck on, well, I don't know how. And so then they, mm-hmm. they automatically discount the goal, the end result, because they get stuck in, well, how am I going to get there? Yep. Because it's big. The how, <laughs> the how is huge, right? When you begin to think, okay, I'm here. I mean, and this is what so many of us, I mean, you're in the same work. A lot yep. of us were in. You talking to people who are you know, on your show and clients. And a lot of us have others who are colleagues who, you know, peers who are working with individuals who see, you know, there's, there's your current state and there's your ideal state or your perceived or your, what you believe your ideal state is. Cause you may move closer to that and it may change and that's fine. It's absolutely fine. But when you're at this place and you're looking out and you're thinking, Hmm, that's a long way. That's a lot of crap to do. I don't know if I want to do this. And some folks may decide. I mean, I had one woman who said, you know what? I know that I'm unhappy. It was really interesting. She said, I'm unhappy. I'm not particularly uh, fond of what I'm doing in my work. I've been doing this a long time. I've been in the educational arena for a long time and I'm burned out and I'm bored. But I just want to go home and watch TV every day. I don't really care about doing much more than that. And it was kind of interesting because she doesn't want to explore the how. She doesn't want to explore any of that. She just kind of wants to stay where she is. And maybe she'll change that over time. Who knows? But there's some folks who may say, you know what, that's just too much to do. I don't I don't feel like changing that. And we know we all love being comfortable, right? Right. <laughs> it's nice to nestle in and be comfortable. It's familiar. Doesn't require much of us. And we can kind of lean on that crutch and say, well, you know, I don't have to do much. I don't have to be responsible for much. But if you want to get to your ideal, your desired state, there are some things that need to be done. And the how does look big, but you're not doing that alone. We all know, we know that. You and I know that. Yep. Your listeners know that. We're not doing yep. that alone. So don't worry about the how. And just one step at a time, one small step at a time, if we can just stop being overwhelmed by the bigness of all that needs to be done to get to our desired state and take one step at a time and be joyful in that moment with what we're doing and what we're exploring and what we're figuring out and how we're being curious, et cetera. That's going to make the journey a good one because it's not just about arriving. Oh yeah. It's about enjoy, enjoying that process. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, even when we first started and I said, what, how is your journey to Morbin? And you said, well, I'm still, you know, I'm still on it. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and I'm glad that I'm still on it. I don't really yeah. want it to be over for me. That's where the fun is, Kristen. I mean, I'm just talking personally. The fun is in the journey, learning along the way. It is. I think that there are markers, though, that are clear because every goal that is achieved leads you to the next one. And yep. so each part of the journey is is kind of a section, you know, and okay, I'm here. This is awesome. Now I want to go here. This is awesome. And so it's the fun is always in the journey, the exploration, the curiosity, like you said, and the expansion. Yeah. Because as you're on the as you're uh, moving through the process and you're on this journey, you're changing. So who you were when you started or who you were when you became aware 
that you're starting. Let me put it yeah. that way. Because I think <laughs> we're starting once we get here. But right. when you're when you become aware of of the of this this journey or the process that you're taking, you're changing constantly, which is why that's shifting. So there's this this complexity to the journey, but at the same time it's it's simple. It's really interesting. That stuff just like really fascinates me. Um so yeah, there's this complexity to to the journey where you know, you are shifting and changing and you're learning and growing and people are coming in and going out of your life, whether it's work or whether it's relationships or whatever it is. But there's this complexity, but life itself is simple, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, I find it, like I said, I find it all just utterly fascinating and fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and the more playful it is, the more fun it is, uh, I think the easier it is. And and what I see, tell me if you see this in some of your folks and some of your clients or the people that you engage with is everybody likes to make things so serious. It's so yeah. serious. It's life or death. It is brain surgery. It is it is so it's so deep and serious and I'm just like just just chill. Like it's going to be okay. chill. like it's, it's just it's part of it. Be curious, have fun. And I think, I, you know, I want to hear your take on this. I think that it scares people to have fun and to do what they love because it's what, it's not what the system teaches. It's not what society teaches. Work hard, like do, do exactly. this and you get a paycheck. Right. It, it has become, I think it, it is overly serious and we don't learn how to have fun. We don't know how to laugh and know how to relax because, um, by accident. That's a part of how we're made. That's a part of what makes the journey a pleasant one. And when we're overly serious, we take ourselves too seriously. We get all wrapped up and then we begin to manifest physical symptoms. And that's where a lot of people are stressed out and they, they're sleep deprived and all these things that we're hearing about that so many people in the business world are talking about now. How to get more sleep, how to be less stressed, how to feel less overwhelmed. I mean, how many five tips to this and seven tips to that and 10 tip tips to, you know, uh, conquer overwhelm because people are, people are in this space where they're not enjoying themselves. They're just, they're just running and working so hard and thriving and grinding and thrusting and pushing and pulling. And it's like, gosh, yeah. just saying that made me exhausted. Right. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the fun in it, I mean, I certainly embrace that. And one of the things that I say, my approach is pro functional. Um, I put, I, love I that. take the fish out and I put the fun in. And I think that it's an, it's a beautiful blending of that. There's, there's a place for professionalism. Absolutely. But if I'm doing something and I'm not having fun with it, then I'm going to ask myself, why am I doing this? And how does this contribute to my overall, to overall, you know, what I'm trying to accomplish, who I'm trying to be in the world. And so if it's something that I need to do, for example, as a business owner, there's some things I need to do. I don't love every aspect of being a business owner, but those parts that I don't enjoy necessarily, that are my priority top, like, ooh, sweet spot, get me all excited. Woohoo. I figure out a way to make them fun. Um, so I think that that's, that's something that really needs to, to be discussed more, figuring out a way to put the fun and the joy back into what it is that we're doing and not take ourselves and other people so seriously. I mean, I think that's what's wrong in our world today. We just take each, our, each other and ourselves too seriously, right? Yeah. I think that's what causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress is that yep. everything is so um, – I mean, life or death. I mean, and, it, and it's really not. I mean, some things are, but... Um, it's going to all be okay. All it's all going to be okay. okay. It's, it's all going to be okay. Just breathe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just breathe and laugh a little. Smile a little. Have a little fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So in this space, in this space where you're um, working with, with clients... Um, and even even students, right? So it could happen in any space. What are some of the obstacles and rewards that you see in creating a work life <clears throat> that you really desire? I think the obstacles to doing that 
are around trying to please other people um, and thinking that it's bigger than it is and taking yourself too seriously, what we were just talking about. And I think in working with, you know, students in particular, because that's where I'm shifting more of my energy, attention, focus, and resources, that just helping them to realize that they're the expert on them Mm -hmm. and that if they can just learn how to have a really crucial conversation with the people where they feel like they're having this pressure, whether it's a parent or a guardian or, you know, in some cases a spouse because some college students are married, whatever the case may be. I think these are some of the obstacles uh, to them on this particular journey to getting there. Um, And if they could just kind of get out of their own way, not take themselves too seriously and have fun in the process and realize that that pressure, they can address that. It's hard to have a conversation with someone who we think we might displease if we don't do what they want. That's hard as heck to have that kind of conversation, but it's possible. It's possible to have those crucial conversations. So to be able to help them. So I think those are some of the obstacles. If I understood your question correctly, um, and some of the the joys of of moving closer to doing work that's just right that matters that you love is that you get to do it every day and you love it you get to wake up and be excited about what you're going to be contributing today at any given time throughout the day that doesn't mean that every minute of every day you're like blissful and skipping and throwing daisies <laughs> <laughs> right but it means generally speaking there's a certain joy that's underneath all of the even ebb and flowing that you experience on a day-to-day basis. There's joy that's right underneath the surface there because you've made a decision to say yes to yourself, to say yes to doing what makes you happy. And that ultimately leads to you serving and helping others. And so I think that that's the big joy and it's worth whatever you have to sacrifice to get to that point, speaking personally and speaking, you know, from someone who observes others moving through that process and getting to that point, I think it's worth everything that you need to do to get to that point of being in a place where you're contributing your way, engaging in work that's just right for you, that matters, that, you know, designing the work life is best for you. Right. What do you think about that phrase, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life? I agree with that, but I think that there has to be some other conversation around that because I think sometimes folks have kind of bought into that idea and they're like, okay, I'm doing what I'm loving, but I'm broke as dirt. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So there's a balance to that. It's like, yes, I think that's true. But adding something to that conversation that, yes, when you're doing what you love, you're not working. And also, I think it's important in that to identify or define what work means. And I think we all have these very interesting definitions of what work means for us. And there's a another um tool that I have on my website related to perception and I have the perception around work success and money and for Mm -hmm. example I'll say well what does work equal and it's amazing how people will answer that most people when you ask them work equals they'll give you some kind of response that's heavy and negative that requires some kind of like we talked about earlier the hard the grind you know work equals um you know, hard, work equals um, obligation, work equals have to. And it's like when you see where people are starting from with their definition of work, that tells that tells you so much. Oh, yeah. Because if we have a negative perception of work, then that, that phrase that you just used, it, yep. it, it, it's going to get, there's going to be some confusion in as to what that actually means, how that plays out. So I believe that statement, but I believe that there's a lot of conversation that needs to be had around that and defining what some of those words in that statement actually mean to each individual. And would you or do you then help them create a conscious shift around the perception of work so that they're more open 
to the positive aspects of work because clearly if there's a negative connotation like the heaviness that you described Mm -hmm. there needs to be some somewhat of a mindset shift around that I think just asking the question and having someone think about that and answer it is powerful in and of itself Kristen I've Mm -hmm. seen like the facial expressions and body language like shift immediately when you say well what does work equal to you and then they say something and it's almost like they hear themselves out loud say it and it's like well dang (laughs) right I don't where did that come from or hmm interesting I never thought about it that way and so then you begin to kind of unpack that and say okay so let's talk about where that whose definition is that Where did that come from? Where did that core belief? Because that's a core belief. If you believe it, you're going to make decisions based on work being heavy. You're going to make decisions based on work from a negative perspective. So the decisions that you make aren't going to be ones that are going to lead you closer to where you really want to be, where you feel this kind of lightness and this joy because you're starting from a core belief that's heavy and negative. So I think just asking the question is a great first start. And then from there, have a discussion around, okay, so what are some ways we can shift this? How can you even look at your current work situation differently? I mean, I've had clients who've come to, come to me and they've been totally overwhelmed, hated their job. I got to quit this. And they have left after an hour's conversation thinking, hmm, you know what? I can think about this differently. If I can start with challenging some of my beliefs around just this position that I hate, I can leave here looking at even this position in a different way and seeing it more as a contribution. And how can I address this in a more uh, in a way where there's more challenge and excitement and me taking more responsibility in this area as opposed to maybe whining about it or using it as a crutch, etc. So the conversations can be pretty fascinating once you ask that question. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, um, I was having some conversations yesterday with some colleagues around being complacent with work, like people Mm -hmm. that are going through the motions and that when they're settling and they're consciously settling, um, because they're in this, I I call it like the limbo space of, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where I want to go, which is what we addressed a little while ago is what do you really want? Right. So before that Mm -hmm. person really identifies what they want, sometimes, okay, I've got a good job. It pays a good income. You know, it's not something I hate. It's not something I love. It's just, eh. And it's, and maybe there's comfort there because it's what, you know, it's what you're attached to. So, um, do you ever see those kind of people come in because they know that there's something more and that's gnawing at them, but they're the comfort level of where they are. There's so much fear around moving out of that. Mm -hmm. I certainly have seen folks. um, I've had a few folks that have come in with that, you know, standing on from that perspective, I guess I'm trying to say, I think a lot of them don't. Because if you start to have the conversation, then you become more aware of how unhappy you are and being stuck in how you define. Because I would want someone to define what they think is mediocre because this isn't about a general definition of mediocrity or meaningless, meaninglessness. This is about you. Oh, of course. You believe that what you're doing is tapping into your greatness. Do you believe that where you are is where you want to be? Do you believe that there's more for you? I mean, your show is meant for more. Asking that question, do you think that you're reaching for more based on your own criteria of what that is? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes folks don't want to have that conversation because maybe they're not ready to roll up their sleeves and do what's necessary. And yeah, it's their yeah. life. They're totally, it's totally up to them to make that decision. But I think that there is a lot of, you know, job satisfaction statistics certainly support the fact that there's uh, quite a few, almost a majority of people who just are kind of stuck and they feel like they're stuck. But there's no stuck. There's always a choice. I mean, right. you know, 
the, the reality is, is that we, we look at work as a way to, we go to work, we exchange a service or product and we get money for it. It's a job. Right. We get money. We need money. We need to pay our food, clothing, shelter. We need to pay for that. That's true. Bottom line. Right. Yes. But besides that, we don't want to be locked in fear around that and just right. say that this is, this is how I'm going to make all of my decisions. There's a way to have even a good enough or a great enough position where we're able to take care of those necessities. And then over here, be exploring and building something that lead us to the work that's just right for us to work that we love. So some people don't even realize that. It's like, well, I just have to do this. And this is what I have to do going forward. And it's like, that's not true. You don't have to resign yourself to this is the only choice I have. That's just not true. It's right. not. And I'll challenge anyone. I mean, anyone to that. <laughs> right. Right. And and that's why that's why I created this show, because I, be- I truly believe that everyone is capable of of accessing their more, um, whatever that may be. And, and so I think that, um, and that's why I'm so excited that you came on because that's also what you do in a, in a very specific way. I think that accessing your more is about stepping outside of your comfort zone. It's about making a decision, a different choice, a commitment to yourself and to your dreams. And it goes beyond right where you are because it's about stepping into and becoming who you want to be and that's also right. about growth yep it is um and i do want to speak to the fact that you know everyone may not want to step out of that yeah and that's cool i'm not yeah. talking to the people who don't want to i'm not right. i'm not into convincing <laughs> Right, right, That's right. not my role. My role isn't to convince you of anything. Right. But if you're feeling unsell- unsettled, I like to say if you're feeling wobbly, you're feeling yeah. a little wobbly, then yeah, let's have a conversation because I believe it's possible for everyone, but that doesn't mean everyone believes it's possible for themselves. And so for those who don't think it's possible, they're all on the naysaying side and they're a little grumpy around that or a little prickly as one of my friends said yesterday. She's like, I'm feeling that. prickly today. Prickly. <laughs> it's like, that's cool. That's all right. I'm not that this, you're not the one who I'm trying to chat with. I want to talk to those who say, you know what? Something's off and I want to do something about it. And I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't want to let this go to get this because I don't know what's on the other side, but I'm willing to have the conversation. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and figure it out. And even if I don't feel willing, I'm, I'm cool with telling you that so that you can help me to even move past that resistance. Right. Those, those are the folks I want to, I want to support because I think there are enough of those folks out there. And maybe there are some who, who may not be there now, Kristen, but maybe yeah. they'll be there later. Because how many of us, I mean, when I think about myself, there were certain points in my life when there are things you could have said to me and I wouldn't have been open to it. Oh, yeah. But as time goes on, you shift, you change, you become more open to the possibilities and you allow things in. And the more you allow in, you shift and change and you begin to see things just slowly evolve and unfold and expand and all that. And then you begin to see. So sometimes it's just timing. Maybe it's not the right time for some folks. And that's okay. No judgment. No judgment. Right. Just love. Just love. I <laughs> Just love, love. that. <laughs> Just love. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because everybody has a time. And um, yeah, I remember a couple years back I was working with a client and she was going through a relationship um relationship struggle and I and I remember at the same time she was she was not happy in her career but that was not something that she could handle at that point in time because her all of her focus and attention was on this relationship and so it was it was just not the time for that and then um as she got the relationship part settled she was like you know what I've been wanting to talk about this for a while and I knew with my insight that bringing up the career stuff at the time that she was going through this relationship turbulence, she was um, leaving a long-term, um, like an engagement. 
they were engaged in, they were breaking up. It wasn't the time to bring that up. Hey, by the way, because that would have been way too overwhelming for her. But I, I could see in the things that she shared um, in our sessions that that was that that was also bothering her. But to shift the focus, right? Just it wasn't there, and so I. I let it slide, continued to help her focus on the relationship, working on getting past that. And then, um, you know, she, she came to me. So I think that that's Mm -hmm. the, that's also part of this is allowing people to direct their own journey instead of, um, which I know you don't do this, but I'm just saying this for the sake of one, you know, one of the things you said earlier is really some people are not open to stuff and it's, I know it's not my job to push people off the plank. It's not your job to push Mm-mm. people off the plank. I'm Jump. not doing any kind of plank pushing. No man. Right, no plank pushing. Mm-mm. Right. But that was something that was very evident as an example of in, in my work that I knew that that was something she wasn't happy in, but she had to be the one to vocalize it and say, Hey, I'm ready to work on this. And you know, it's interesting, you know, as you were sharing that, I was thinking, because I think it's a journey for all of us who are in, who choose to contribute in a way where we're providing a service and supporting others because we care so much about the human journey. And we want right. to see people in these spaces of joy because we understand something around that that we want to share. You know, certainly early on when I took this on, there was an impatience on my part because, you know, you get really excited when you can know something and you want to yep. tell everybody. It's like, oh, I want to tell them. And you want to tell everybody and if they don't want to hear. It's like, why don't you want to hear? You should hear this. You should do this. You should, 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 should. Right. So, <laughs> so I think there's a process that we all go through where we come to this. I don't know what you would call it. I guess I call it this kind of tapping into the inner wisdom around all is going to be well, understanding each person has his or her own journey and it's up to them to decide what they want to do with it or not do with it. And if they ask for help, be there and prepared to meet them where they are. Right. And if they don't ask for it, respect that and love them still. Right. And, if they ever come to a point where they do want your help, certainly, but it may not even be they want your help. Maybe your way isn't the right way for them. Maybe your style, your flavor right. isn't theirs. Then be willing to say, you know what? I just want you to get what you want. I know somebody. Here, try them out. See if it's a fit. So I think it's a process for those who of us who are in this space too to get to that space ourselves where if we truly are wanting to make a contribution and uh, be joyful in what we're doing and make decisions from a place of love and not fear, then we need to move to that space too, where we're okay with whatever anyone says about what they want or don't want without being pushy or controlling or being impatient. Again, just loving them and saying, okay, I'm still going to support you and want and want to support your success, no matter what that is for you. But that's your decision to decide what that is. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's, that's really key because that's when you're, you're truly in love with, um, you know, we, we see everybody's potential. I mean, I, I mean, I can see where, Oh, that's, that would be great. And I love the way that you describe that because, some people are not ready to accept that and it's their journey. It's not ours, right? It's, it's, it's theirs. Yep, and so it's totally theirs. having the love to kind of take a step back to, mm-hmm. to push when they need a push. Cause I've, I've had some people that are like, push me, <laughs> you know, right, but they're asking you for, they're it. asking you to they're push, asking, right? They're not just going up to them and pushing them at yeah. rent because you think yeah. that's where they should go. It's not about exactly. that. But they ask you for it. So respecting that, respecting the journey. Absolutely. Respecting each person's journey, you know? I think what do you so love important. most about the work that you do? If you could pick just one thing, what would that be? I, gosh, I love being in a position to sit in front of someone and observe their greatness. Because it's in everybody. And I think some people debate that, but I don't. I can see it in everyone. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's 
it, I feel like I've been that way my whole life since I was a little, since I was a kitty pop. Just being able to see the greatness in others and to be able to fan those flames if they allow it, right? So I yeah. think that's the most fun for me to sit across from someone and just see their greatness because it's so freaking awesome to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. And then, of course, there's feel I feel like there's a zillion other things that I love about it, but that's probably the the thing I love. I love the most. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know in my work, I love, I love it. Um, I love to see people like really the epiphanies and then the action taking, like when, when they move past the fear, when they really uncover it. And like you had said earlier, the the look on their faces when, mm-hmm. oh, that's what that is. The, and I call them these little periods of awakening because they mm-hmm. found something that was really buried within, beneath. And when you uncover it, and they're mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Definitely. I think that couple, you know, seeing that and sharing their greatness, seeing what I see as far as their greatness is concerned and seeing them respond to that. Like you said, seeing the body language, because I'm yep. always looking at the body language, too, and the facial expressions. And when I see the body language relax, when I see them, their bodies relax into the conversation after we've had this kind of conversation, maybe specifically about their greatness and what they're good at. Because a lot of people, oh, I'm not getting anything. I don't have anything to contribute or whatever. You know, you can have that conversation. And to have that conversation and then begin to, again, just asking the question, like I said about the perception of like, what does work mean? Just asking some of the simple questions and having them respond to it and seeing that is pretty darn cool. Um, it's, it's great work. I love it, love it, love it. I love it. Tell us where can people find you? Where, <laughs> where do you hang out? Where can you find me on this big old highway of the internet? Uh, Robin, R-O-B-I-N, C as in cat, Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D dot com. So don't forget the C in the middle, Robin C. Crawford dot com. And currently, that is where you can find me. Um, I'm working on a project now related to uh, undergraduates in college because that is where that's just like my number one priority heart. This is my labor of love I'm working on now. But the general site is robincrawford.com. And there you'll find Creative Work Life Solutions with me. Uh, I have a once a month love your success letter that I'm currently uh, putting out. So please feel free to sign up for that. I have a couple freebies there. And when you go to that site and you click the freebies page, what you'll find there is the work print inner size that I referenced earlier. Uh, the perception and relationship with money, work, and success inner size that I talked about as well. And then uh, a little short uh, three or four, uh, maybe it's five or six pages, where there are seven key questions you can ask yourself to begin to jumpstart your work-life design process. So, you know, mosey on over there, take advantage of those, and uh, see what, you know, I've got going on there. And you're more than welcome to sign up for a possibilities conversation. That's uh, I spent about an hour to to 90 minutes with someone. It's a a minimal price. I reduced that significantly. But during that time, we really dive in and spend some time talking. And you will leave with a a shift in perception. And you will leave with some specific to-dos. And if you decide to continue, we can do that. If you say, I got what I needed, that's cool, too. So, yeah, go on over to robincrawford.com and check it out. And if you have any questions, send me an email. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Pinterest. I'm on LinkedIn. Check me out. Do you have a business page on Facebook? Uh, I do not have a business page on – I mean, yes, I'm sorry. I do have a business page on Facebook. I was thinking you said LinkedIn. I do have a business page on Facebook. It's Creative Work Life Solutions. Awesome. Creative Work Life Solutions. Exactly. You can find all of that when you go to my website. You'll be able to find all of the links to that too. So, yeah, check it out. See what I'm up to and let's chat. I'd love to have a, a possibilities conversation with you. Yay. 
Yay! Thanks, Robin. I'm That's so glad. So this went so fast. It did go fast. Zoom. I know. I had a great time. And thank you for all you do and for being you, Kristen. You are awesome. And thank you for doing this. I really really love you for this. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yay. um, Thank you, everybody, for listening. It has been another amazing show. Um, One of the things that I forgot to mention at the beginning of today's uh, show is that we are now accepting call-ins. And so uh, next week, if you guys want to call in on our guests, um, I will be giving the number out um, and at the beginning of the show. So that's something that uh, I totally forgot and um, dropped the ball on. But next week, call-ins. If you want to call in and speak with our guests, um, that's something that we are now doing at Bold Radio Station. I am so excited. Okay. Once again, thank you everyone for listening. To continue the conversation, hop on over to the Seekers group on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Seekers Path. And to grab your very own Seekers Guide workbook, head on over to kristenloyd.com and click on free gifts. Until next time, you are meant for more. Keep seeking, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thanks for tuning in to Meant for More, the Seeker's Guide to Success. But the fun doesn't end here. Head over to KristenLloyd.com for your Seeker's Guide workbook filled with exercises to help you go from mediocre to magically magnificent.